I welcome you here on this spring break day for SICE. It's pretty quiet around here, but we're glad you, you came for this um, timely and I think important uh, event and discussion, which will become increasingly important as we approach the uh, G7 summit at the end of May in Japan. To introduce our moderator, who we're very honored to have um, with us today, it's uh, Mr. Clyde Prestowitz, the um, founder and president of the Economic S Strategy Institute, um, a, a very well-known writer on, on global economics and affairs, um, author of, of many seminal books on, on Japan's economic role in U.S.-Japanese relations, um, including the most recent, uh, Japan Restored, which I highly recommend, um, I think published this fall. Um, so once again, thank you. Jess, thank you. Uh, Alan, thank you very much. I think the way we're going to proceed is just down the line. We'll begin with Sheila, but let me say a couple of moment on things before we begin. So Sheila Smith is well known to all of you. She's a senior fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations on Japan. Uh, she has um, a long, distinguished, I shouldn't say so long, but uh, <laughs> distinguished uh, record in uh, Asia and particularly focusing on Japan. Uh, we'll follow her with Josh Walker, who is the VP of Global Programs at APCO Worldwide. It's a leading uh, consulting communications strategy company in Washington. He's a transatlantic fellow of the, uh, the Asia program at the German Marshall Fund, teaches at Elliott School, GW, and again, uh, a distinguished career. And then uh, finally, uh, Wayne Mary, uh, who has spent uh, a career in Russia and uh, Eastern Europe, Ukraine particularly, uh, and is particularly apropos at this moment with regard to Japan and uh, Russia. So without further ado, let me just turn it to Sheila. Uh, we'll all, each of the panelists will speak for 10 or 12 minutes, uh, and then I hope we can get a lively discussion. So Sheila, take it away. Thank you so much, Clyde. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Um, it's an important topic. It's only gonna continue to be important, and so I will warn you, though, uh, I've just written a book on Japan-China. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to go back and think again about Japan, Russia, um, and today's opportunity stimulated a little of that for me. Um, I just wanted that we're very focused on Mr. Abe and Mr. Abe's diplomacy, his relationship with Putin, uh, how Japan stands vis-a-vis -vis the G7 in, uh, and its own national interests uh, with Russia, its neighbor to the north. I just want to remind you that this is not a relationship that is a close relationship historically, right? They've always been uneasy uh, neighbors and they've had a particularly troubled uh, effort at negotiating in the post-war period, post-World War II period, right? Uh, we can start with the Russo-Japanese War if you'd like, but we don't have to. Um, but I want you to understand too that in the northern part of Japan, uh, the military concentration of Soviet forces was a serious uh, security threat for the Japanese. Uh, Russian forces, diminished as they are today, but continue to operate at pretty much the same pace uh, in Japan's northern border. So this is not a country that only has economic interests at stake. Uh, it's also a country for Japan that has serious strategic uh, interests as well. Um, the second piece of the puzzle is the background of the bilateral attempt to negotiate a peace treaty between those two countries, mm -hmm. right? The, I think the most the closest that Japan and then the Soviet Union got to a, a bilateral peace treaty was in the 1950s. Um, and it was a time, at the time it was Mr. Hatoyama, uh, who really wanted the relationship to transform. Uh, remember there were still POWs that had been in, in, in uh, Siberia, right, in the Soviet Far East for some time after the war, but by the mid 50s Japan was ready for its own post-war and to write the rules and the diplomatic ambitions of Mr. Hatoyama at the time were pretty, st pretty straightforward. Um, the Russians at the time were more interested in peeling Japan away, I think, uh, from a very close association that it inherited with the United States in the, in the Cold War. The territorial dispute, of course, is the main barrier to a peace treaty, and it was at that time in the mid-1950s uh, when they came close to really crafting an agreement that might have been politically possible, and that was the two island agreement, splitting up the four northern territory islands into, into a package. Uh, and the two island solution continues to be an enticing uh, vision, I think, for people who have come back to the table. 
Um, at the end of the Cold War, of course, Mr. Gorbachev and then Mr. Yeltsin were asked to engage also in negotiations with Japan, but they didn't, in the end, uh, get where they needed to be. Um, Japan's territorial dispute with Russia, of course, is not the only one that Japan has. And I think if you think about Japan's strategic interest today, its conversation with Russia is largely about neutralizing uh, one of the, of the territorial disputes that Japan has. The others, of course, are with South Korea, uh, and then the more uh, tricky one that I wrote about in my book with China. Um, it is the only territorial dispute also that the United States takes a clear position in favor of Japanese sovereignty. And that's also for U.S. policymakers to remember that uh, from the period of John Foster Dulles, we were unequivocal about whose sovereignty uh, those islands, uh, the, who had sovereignty over those islands. And so it is the one territorial dispute around Japan where we don't take, uh, we do take sides, I should say. Um, <laughs> up north, you've got fisheries interests, significant fisheries interests. You've got energy interests, of course. Uh, and you've also got separated families. You've also got the distress of war. Um, and so if you travel around Hokkaido and talk to people, there are people who's in prior generations, their families had um, either resided on the islands or they had fished. Uh, they had been part of the extractive industries that have always been part of those islands. Um, Japan's strategic interest is simply it's, it, on its northern border was one of the, the Cold War's uh, most formidable right? um, adversaries. By the end of the Cold War, of course, the Soviet Union was engaged in what they called a bastion strategy, and its nuclear submarines were protected in the Sea of Okhotsk. Uh, the islands themselves did not take on any strategic meaning necessarily, but the fact that the Soviet Union concentrated on its coastal waters uh, as part of its nuclear strategy, I think for the Japanese was uh, very important. Um, so what is Mr. Abe up to and what do I think about it? Um, I'm not sure if we have a time limit here. I just, yeah, I won't, I won't take too much of your time, but let me, I won't retrace all the steps, but the Abe-Putin conversation I think has produced the most progress, if you will, or at least the most anticipated progress, I think, in the bilateral Rus Russia-Japan relationship since the 1950s. I think this is a, 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 a moment when many people in Tokyo think that there is actually concrete um, evidence that, that Russia is interested in, a, if not a peace treaty, at least some kind of normalizing of the relationship and some kind of compromise on the islands. Now. I am not a Russia expert, so I'll defer to the Russian experts in the room. I'm not sure I'm so persuaded that Mr. Putin is willing to come to some kind of compromise on these islands, but I think there is, and especially in the Abe cabinet, there is some definite interest in pursuing this opportunity to see where it, it, it takes them. Um, Abe and Putin came to an agreement in 2013, uh, not long after Mr. Abe returned to office in December 2012. Uh, they outlined a strategic dialogue uh, an economic dialogue, including a trade agreement that was on the table to be discussed. And of course, they, the enhanced energy uh, engagement on both sides. Energy has always, as you know, been a large part of the relationship, despite the political uh, distance between the two capitals. Um, I don't know how many times, I've lost track now of how many times Mr. Abe has met Mr. Putin, um, but he meets him at every major multilateral meeting. There is a sideline summit uh, with the Mr. Putin and Mr. Abe. Uh, of course, one of the key issues here for not only Mr. Abe, but I suspect for Mr. Putin is the China factor. Uh, Japan's distance and tension, strategic tension with China, of course, uh, provides us an added impetus to just the bilateral justification for this normalization or improved relationship. Uh, it's nice to know that there is a possibility of easing uh, Beijing's ability to use the Beijing-Moscow relationship to Japan's disadvantage. If you look at some of the military activities, of course, China and Japan, I'm sorry, China and Russia have had significant exercises in the East China Sea. Uh, Russia has sent its strategic bombers around Japan, despite the politics of the good Abe-Putin relationship. There's been some uh, demonstrable interest on the part of the Russians on putting more military uh, artillery in particular, per perhaps also surface-to-air missiles on these disputed islands. So Mr. Abe has an interest in, if not neutralizing Russia, um, at least pulling it away slightly from what looks to be uh, an enhanced interest in military cooperation between Beijing and Moscow. So where are we today? Well, the G7 uh, sanctions of Russia 
right, on the Crimea uh, referendum and then annexation clearly um, pushed Japan away from what was an accelerated bilateral conversation. Uh, Japan took a stand in support of the G7. Uh, its sanctions have largely, uh, have been fairly moderate compared to Europe and to the United States. It has not signed on completely uh, to all of the ways in which the Europeans, especially the Germans, and the United States have sanctioned Russia. Uh, but nonetheless, it has sanctioned, um, it has signed on to freezing the assets to financial sanctions for export restrictions on arms and, and dual use technology, of course, to those directly responsible. Um, and it's also sanctioned five banks um, uh, for capital transfers, right? Um, but it hasn't stalled completely the diplomacy uh, between Mr. Abe and Mr. Putin. Three things were on the agenda at the time of the G7 uh, sanctions decision. One was a new investment agreement between Japan and Russia, and that has been halted. Uh, there was also interest in a space agreement. That, too, has been put on hold. Uh, and there was a prevention of military activities or dangerous behaviors, a confidence-building measure up in the north, and that has not proceeded either. Um, there is a lot of talk, uh, especially by Mr. Putin, uh, about a state visit in Tokyo. Uh, he has been formally invited by Mr. Abe. Uh, but that has also been put on hold. Um, interestingly enough, Mr. Putin takes uh, the opportunity now and again in public to remind Mr. Abe that he is, has been invited to Tokyo and that he's looking forward to visiting. Um, so uh, it puts Mr. Abe in slightly a little bit of a bind. Um, I, it's obvious to any of us sitting here in Washington, D.C., that the United States would not be terribly happy about Mr. Putin receiving the full treatment of a state visit, including the state dinner with the emperor and a red carpet in Tokyo, right, given the, our situation, but also given the, the, the Russian behavior elsewhere. But I think it's also important to point out that many in Tokyo see the United States diplomacy with Mr. Putin, especially over Syria, and they point out that when national interests are at stake, we too negotiate with people that we don't necessarily want to be best friends with. Um, I think the worry is that Mr. Abe would really actually like to be best friends with Mr. Putin. <laughs> and this is not a marriage of convenience, but in fact, there's more of a personal relationship there um, than, than, than I think some in Washington feel comfortable with. Um, I do think, though, that we have Japan hosting a G7 meeting shortly. Uh, I have been asked upon occasion by Japanese colleagues whether or not um, it's possible that Mr. Putin could be invited to this meeting. And my, my not so clear answer is I can't see the pathway there, uh, in large part because the G7 itself uh, um, is probably not ready to reinvite uh, Mr. Putin. But again, I'm looking forward to, to others commenting on that. But I think there is a slight bit of interest um, on the part of Mr. Abe to f use this G7 meeting that's upcoming in, in Japan, perhaps to the advantage of reducing some of the tensions mm -hmm. uh, that he faces with Russia. Um, I'll just conclude, we can talk more about some of the specifics later, but I'll conclude with a, a question that I think comes up a lot, and that is, should we be really worried about what Mr. Abe and Mr. Putin would accomplish? And I'm a little bit of a pessimist on the island issue, but I'm looking forward to hearing the Russian perspective on that. Um, I think it's more important for Mr. Putin and Mr. Abe to be seen talking about the islands. I'm not sure that we're, we should expect a mom any moment that we're going to find a compromise, either a two-island solution or otherwise. But I think there's interest on both sides in creating just a little bit of doubt uh, in Beijing complete about what the strategic balance in the region is. So I think there's some interest there in muddying the waters just a little bit. Uh, and there's an opportunity on both sides, I think, to, to gain some strategic latitude there. I do think the Mill Mill side is important, frankly. Um, it's an area where, surprisingly, during the Cold War, Japan and the Soviet Union uh, actually made some inroads into the air defense, air interactions uh, between the air forces on both sides. Given the tensions in the region at the moment, I think it would be very advantageous for the Japanese and Russians to revisit uh, their confidence building measures up in the north and to get a little bit more clarity on the intent of some of the Russian operations in the region. It would be interesting if you had a Russian-Japanese naval exercise 
Um, I'm not sure the United States would be very comfortable with all of that. But given the strategic fluidity that's afoot in uh, the Far East, I think we should talk a little bit more about how these different pieces of the puzzle uh, could signal a little bit more complexity <coughs> or maybe respond to the increasingly complex Northeast Asia. My last point is simply that I'm not an expert on the Arctic, but what happens in the Arctic, of course, will, s will change the strategic layout in the Far East, right? And Russia has deep interests in the Arctic. Uh, the Chinese, of course, have growing interests in the Arctic. Japan is going to have to seriously reorient its strategy uh, towards this if we get an Arctic uh, that is more populated by some of its neighbors. And just by geographical necessity, it will become a little bit more crowded alongside and outside of Japanese maritime space uh, if we see that kind of reorientation. So others in the room can speak to that more directly than I can, but let me stop there. Great. Thank you, Sheila. Josh? Great. Let me just pick up right where uh, Sheila left off. It's always great when you follow someone who, who sets the stage as well. Of course, it's always dangerous because you don't know what else you can say there. So I'm going to start right in the present. Um, I just got back from Europe, and what was fascinating about being in Europe and talking about Japan mm -hmm. is, is the realization as, a, as an American that sometimes likes to separate the world into different pieces, right? In Washington, if you're a Europe expert, you stay within your transatlantic space. If you're an Asia expert, you stay within the kind of Asia-Pacific space. And if you do the Middle East, you kind of get stuck whoever's helping you at any given moment. Uh, but when you're in Europe and when you're in Tokyo as well, you begin to realize that perhaps the way that we see things here in Washington may not be the way the world actually operates. And what was fascinating is at a moment in time in which Europe is under extreme crisis, and depending on what country we talk to, any Eastern European will tell you, well, obviously it's what Russia is doing in Ukraine and, and the kind of the, the lack of respect for the international rules-based order we've all created since World War II, uh, or those in the southern part of Europe to say, well, it's a refugee crisis and the lack of U.S. leadership in Syria that has led to this problem. Uh, Europe is really falling apart at its seams, whether because of the Schengen uh, area or whether because of Britain and its exit uh, strategy. Uh, you realize that Russia plays a big role here. Uh, and the disinformation, uh, the propaganda efforts of the Russians that sometimes might be scoffed at in Washington has a really significant effort uh, and impact when you go to places where there are large Russian-speaking populations. And even the fact that you, as a leader, you have to respond to questions. It's almost like, uh, you know, Mr. Obama, is it true that you're a rapist? Having to answer that question in and of itself puts you in a bad situation. And so the questions that are being asked of European leaders is particularly difficult. And what's funny is Europe and Japan only share one neighbor and that's Russia. And Russia spans this Eurasian landmass of which there's a global competition that's, o that's going on right now that, of course, Washington, whether it likes it or not, is involved in. And the calculations that are ongoing, whether it's uh, and the interconnectivity of what happened yesterday in terms of both Russia's uh, announcement that it's going to be ceasing uh, you know, military operations in Syria, or whether it's a terrorist attack that happened in Ankara a couple days before, may seem like not connected things and different experts focus on them. I would actually argue and submit to you that what we're discussing today in terms of Russia-Japanese relations have an impact on all those areas. Uh, and so I'm excited that we're having that conversation. One of the things I wanted to pick up on the thread that, that Sheila talked about was the distinction between personal diplomacy and national diplomacy. And I think particularly in Japan in this day and age, Abe-san uh, Abe and his uh, leadership have really transformed what Japan has been to the United States and also what it is globally. Uh, traditionally, uh, it's very hard to keep track of the Japanese prime minister. Every year it's changing, it's a revolving door. Basically, the UN summit is where you get to meet the new Japanese prime minister. <laughs> so the type of personal diplomacy that Sheila is talking about between uh, Mr. Abe and Mr. Putin would not be possible in different generations. Now, there have been exceptions to the rule, whether it's Koizumi or Nakasone before that. Uh, but the challenge here, of course, is when you don't have the level of stability on the national leader level and it's constantly being fought out in the faction level at the LDP or anything else, it's difficult. So Mr. Abe has created the condition under which actually he, in some ways, seems even more stable, particularly in this election season, than what we think is going to come next. While it's always unpredictable in the U.S. system, uh, the president and kind of the different organs and whether it's the Secretary of State or Secretary of Defense, the two plus two discussions that are happening, that's an interesting area. The one thing I would point out when we talk about Russian naval exercises, uh, Japan has a two plus two yeah, with right. Russia, which is fascinating because all the other countries Japan enjoys two plus two relationships with are actually allies. Russia is the only kind of ambiguous country. I don't want to call it a rival. I don't want to call it an enemy. I don't want to call it a competitor. We can fill in the blanks in our conversation. But it's significant. And I think the, the, the interest here is clear because whether 
you know, regardless of where the U.S.-Japan relationship is, and I want to be very clear, the U.S.-Japan alliance is the foundational and the most important relationship for any Japanese leader. But within that framework, a, a Japanese prime minister only has a few options for success in the international arena. He doesn't really have that many assets in the Middle East. He doesn't have very many assets to, to use in, in Europe. Uh, and, and the major other relationship besides the United States is China. And China is not going as well as it was in the past. And so as a result, you, you're, you're, you're left with limited options. You have kind of the Russia card to play, which I think in some ways shows you uh, less strength but more weakness uh, through strength, if that makes sense, kind of the Yoshida doctrine idea that by being a non-military power, Japan has to use other assets. And by kind of using other uh, leverages, whether it's the U.S.-Japan alliance or otherwise, it will have to have creative <coughs> diplomacy. And so I think that personal level that Mr. Abe has, has added to it is what any country would do in the same situation. Now, the warmth and the unprecedented nature of kind of the steps that they have taken, uh, you can sit in Washington and those of us who are not Russia experts will have to kind of take Mr. Abe's word for it, but he seems very convinced about what's going on and thinks that this personal relationship will translate to national diplomacy. Now, as someone who grew up in Hokkaido and actually could see Russia from my home, uh, unlike Sarah Palin, <laughs> uh, you know, this island issue is a real deal. Uh, and as a Dosanko or somebody who grew up in Hokkaido, uh, Russia is the clear and present right. danger that has always been there. And, and the history of Russia-Japanese relationships is, is, is intrinsically a, a deep one. Um, it's not necessarily that, there, that Russians and Japanese hate each other. There's a deep level of respect on both sides ever since the Russo-Japanese War, where Japan was the first non-white, uh, non-Western empire to actually beat another uh, player that set the tone for kind of the rest of the 20th century. So in some ways, uh, there's a deep level of respect. And when you go to personal diplomacy, you have to talk about the leaders in, in Japan and where they come from. You reference Hatoyama, who also had a prime minister whose son did a very different pivot in a different direction than the U.S. would have liked. And Mr. Abe himself, uh, his father was a foreign minister of Japan. He is evidently uh, talked about his dying wish to really bring Russia-Japanese relations together. And then, of course, his grandfather, uh, that was a big champion of Japanese foreign policy and being more of a global power. So these personal histories matter. Also, the, the area in which Mr. Abe himself grew up, the prefecture is, is known for being kind of a more revolutionary uh, area. And so I think the, the, the key here is to just think about how all these factors play together. Now, not one individual of these factors is going to lead to a direct outcome. But in an environment as fluid as we currently are living in, in which Japan is back on the, national sta on the international stage as a global player, about to host a G7 summit, there are things that the Japanese prime minister and as host, they can do. They can invite leaders. So they have the ability theoretically, to just simply invite Mr. Putin to come. And what's happening right now, the flirtation in terms of the timing, is very fascinating. So as Sheila has said, Mr. Putin has already been invited to a state visit. Imagine the optics of this, though. Imagine that President Putin comes to Japan in the month of May when the G7 summit will be had. Even if he's not at the G7 summit, the shadow of Mr. Putin and the effect that Mr. Putin will use and the way that Russia uses every opportunity, all these meetings that Mr. Abe and Mr. Putin have together, including at the Sochi Winter Olympics when nobody else wanted to show up, are used to great effect to show to the Russian people that Mr. Putin is still a respected international leader. And it's an extreme frustration to Washington and other capitals that are trying to isolate Russia. Now, what's interesting from a Japanese perspective is where I started uh, talking about Europe uh, and Japan, they're in the same place. I would predict, unless Russia does something extremely egregious, and you might say, what else could it possibly do? It's already invaded another country. It's already bombing uh, in, in the Middle East. It, it's really put itself back on the agenda. Is there much else that it can do? From a Japanese perspective, you, a lot of people would say, look, what, well, what, with what Russia is doing in Eastern Europe, it's not all that different than what China is doing. But I think there is a bit of a qualitative difference, right? I think when you invade a land border and you completely disregard it, it's a little bit different than kind of taking the gray zones or kind of the unclear international territorial waters, which America is not even a party to, right? And America is not a signatory to the UN uh, UNCLOS. And so as a result, it makes it particularly difficult from a legal and from international norm point of view to point these things out. And Japanese will say, look, China is hiding right behind Russia. Whatever Russia is doing, China's right there in the background hoping to get away with this. And so from a Japanese point of view, it's particularly troubling because Russia seems like the egregious bad guy. And actually, from, from a Japanese point of view, what they're doing may not be all that different than China, and they want more attention focused on China. And so as a result, a lot of these international forums and multilateral forums become the, the obvious stage on which these di disputes and difficulties begin to play themselves out. And I think it's interesting to, to look at the fact that when I think about the international environment today, and you just, whatever side of the aisle you sit on, the criticism you hear about President Obama and about European leaders is they seem weak in the international stage. 
And the leaders that are seen to be strong are not just the authoritarian leaders. It's not just Mr. Putin and Mr. Xi in China. It's leaders like Mr. Abe and Mr. Modi of India that are demonstrating a very different set of characteristics as, as, as kind of democratic leaders. They, they show a flash of populism. They show a flash of nationalism. Now, traditionally in, in, in this town, when any newspaper, including the New York Times, writes about Prime Minister Abe, they label him as a conservative nationalist, which in this country, particularly with what's going on right now in the, the, the Republican Party and Mr. Trump's rallies, gives us shudder. It makes us feel like, okay, this is a really dangerous trend. It's not as dangerous in places like Japan that are in some ways trying to become, quote unquote, a beautiful nation, which is what Abe uses, or a more normal nation, as German leaders in the past have said. And it's fascinating to listen to the conversations happening right now in Europe about Germany's role and basically saying, we're frustrated with the rest of Europeans. They're not following the lead, therefore we will do this alone, and we don't need just NATO or EU. The Chancellor Merkel herself will negotiate, and she will go with Hollande or Cameron or any other leader she needs to have these conversations with Mr. Putin. And the same can be said about Mr. Abe, who says, look, we want to be a part of the system. We want the U.S. to be more grounded. We want the U.S. to have a larger role. But if the U.S. is not going to step up to its role in certain areas, we will have to go this mm -hmm. alone, not in the sense that Japan is going to challenge uh, militarily, but it's going to make strategic investments, like in the Indian Ocean, like in Central Asia, in some ways to find a way to play out uh, this great game that's playing out uh, throughout the Eurasian landmass. And Japan has tools that are sometimes underestimated, just because the hard power capabilities of Japan, which has significant hard power, by the way, just because it doesn't have a military uh, doesn't mean that the self-defense forces are not n uh, as competent. And so when you think about Japan's role there, and when you think about the role and the brand of Japanese multinationals, whether it's major investments or major brands around the world, those are really significant uh, for countries in Central Asia, significant for India, Southeast Asia, Middle East, other areas. The challenge is, can the U.S. and Japan work together in this area? And particularly on Russia, there does seem to be a bit of a misalignment problem. And so I think what we're going to end up seeing is Prime Minister Abe coming to Washington Washington before any type of Russian visit comes. And I think there's going to be a real attempt by the Prime Minister to sit down with President Obama and to explain clearly and communicate clearly. Because Russia is using misinformation and is miscommunicating on purpose, the Japanese are not as good sometimes at communicating their purposes. And because the U.S.-Japan alliance has so many layers to it, there's an assumption that U.S.-Japan alliance managers know what's going on and that's all that matters, as opposed to talking directly to the American people, directly to civil society in the way that Mr. Abe did last year in terms of coming directly to the American Congress. This time around, I expect it to be a much more uh, bilateral and more state-to-state -state level. And I think if uh, Mr. Abe is successful in explaining that he might be a successful bridge in terms of bringing Russia back in to, out of the cold, I don't think at the G7, as Sheila said, but I do think finding a way, whether it's with Mr. Putin and, and or Kerry and Lavrov trying to find a way in Syria to work together on things, finding some type of uh, way to, to look past what's happening in Ukraine, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. And I think, of of course, that leads to immediate questions and problems about, okay, what is the status quo? Has that been officially broken in Ukraine? We'll never go back. Can we move forward? But I would assume, based on my conversations both in Europe and Japan, that neither Europeans or Japanese are very keen on renewing sanctions, which will be coming up right beforehand. So I think as we look towards the G7 summit, It'll be interesting to see the pageantry and the symbolism that will be employed here because clearly uh, if there's not a united front, if Japan is not seen to be 100% on board, any bit of daylight, any bit of difference that, that's seen is going to cause problems in the U.S.-Japanese and, and Japanese more global relationships. And at the same time, Japan is going to point to those differences and say, yeah, but we have the same differences over China and there's not the same level of discussion. Why are you so concerned on this one particular country? Why are you focusing only on the bilateral? Um, so I'll leave that there for, for food for, for kind of food for thought uh, as we move into the questions and answer. But I think I'll leave it right there for the time being. Great. Thank you, Josh. So Wayne, how's it look from Russia? Okay. As many of you probably know, I'm a late addition to this panel, which has the advantage that I didn't actually have to prepare very much. <laughs> uh, I'm not actually going to talk about uh, Russia and the G7. If you want to know about that, just read it. I already wrote it. Uh, <laughs> I want to focus on three points. One, that I think are not well understood in this city. One, which has already been spoken to, is that there are significant expectations between Moscow and Tokyo of tangible improvements in their relationship. Uh, and that the one country in the then G8, which had high expectations for the Russian presidency a few years ago, was Japan. I mean, the only two uh, leaders which went to the uh, Winter Games were uh, the Italian 
and the Japanese. There's no question that Shinzo Abe had hopes that the later G7 presidency of Russia and the summit in, uh, in Sochi would yield significant tangible benefits in the bilateral relationship between those two countries. Now, I thought those expectations were excessive and overly optimistic, and I said so at the time. But that doesn't mean that they were not genuinely felt. That means that Japan made a significant political and diplomatic sacrifice when it joined the American-led response to Russian actions in Ukraine. Uh, that for Japan, it was not just a matter of economic sanctions, it was a matter of putting on hold a diplomatic and political process for which it had significant expectations. I think few people in Washington understand that from Tokyo's perspective, Tokyo made a real sacrifice in deference to its American ally on this issue. I think very few people in Washington appreciate that perspective. Second, the, the Russian position in the Far East is, shall we say, variegated. Uh, the Russians have talked about their pivot to Asia uh, and so on, their new relationship uh, with China and so on and so forth. Uh, behind that, the, the Far East is nothing but problems for Russia. I mean, look, Russia does not expect a pivot to the Far East to be anything more than temporary and tactical. Russia is demographically, economically, and in every other way a European country. Russia expects that the European aspect of sanctions on Russia are short-term and uh, is something that Russia can get past and that the relationship Russia has had previously with Europe and most of the European countries will return. Uh, it does not have any desire to make itself a junior partner to China. Very few people in Moscow are under any illusions uh, about the uh, long-term uh, attitudes of Chinese towards Russia based on their long history, uh, and or that the shift to mm -hmm. an Asian-oriented policy is expensive to Russia. I mean, I remember one uh, Russian businessman came back from one of the negotiations over oil deals with China and just said bluntly, they squeezed us like a lemon. Mm -hmm. Now, what the Russians look at is the fact that they are an Asian Pacific country, but have difficulty maintaining themselves as a serious Asian Pacific power. This is in part because the demographic decline of the Russian Far East has been the most extreme of any region in Russia, because the Russian Far East is still at the end of this tenuous uh, railway connection, since there's, there's still no highways that go the whole way. Traditionally, the Russian Far East has been linked to European Russia more by sea freight than by, by rail or air freight. Uh, and that's always been a problem, continues to be. And, of course, because of the huge economic growth that has taken place in China, in South Korea, in Japan, in other countries, which Russia collectively, as a whole country, cannot match, let alone match in its Far Eastern territories. Beyond that, is the problem that there is a naval arms race going on in that part of the world uh, in which Russia feels it must try to keep up but will inevitably fall further and further behind. This is in part because the Russian Far Eastern Fleet is one of four fleets. The most important of the Russian fleets is the Northern Fleet because of r recent Russian policy toward Ukraine and Europe the Russians are now having to actually spend more on their Baltic and Black Sea, fleets, Black sea fleets than they otherwise would have done, which leaves fewer and fewer resources to try to keep up their end of a competition in the Far East. But fundamentally, they face the problem there that they faced in 1904, which is the Chinese, Korean, and Japanese fleets are home fleets, whereas the Pacific fleet is a distant fleet for Russia. And that's a competition you can't win, even if you don't even include the United States Navy in the issue. Which means that over time, in the relative naval balance in that part of the world, in terms of numbers of combatants, quality of combatants, and capabilities, Russia will fall farther and farther behind. And they know it. My third point 
is that Russia would certainly like to improve its relations with Japan. But there is a fundamental asymmetry, which is Russia would like that relationship to improve while putting to the side the territorial dispute. Mm -hmm. This is something, obviously, that Tokyo does not want to do. Uh, in an earlier life, I advised the Secretary of Defense here on the Russia-Japanese relationship, which I spent a fair amount of time looking into. And one of the things that struck me is that in contrast to other territorial disputes that I've worked on, like Cyprus and Nagorno-Karabakh and so forth, the extent to which Tokyo and Moscow talk past each other, not just talking, yelling, disagreeing, but actually not understanding where the other side is coming from, uh, is really quite extreme. In Moscow, there remains the view that in Japan, the Northern Territories issue is artificial. That it's something that, uh, the, that is being whipped up by a Japanese government uh, for purposes of putting pressure on Moscow. There's very little understanding of how genuine and deeply held and politically salient this issue is in Japan. On the other hand, in Tokyo, I'm bound to say there tends to be a view that the Japanese position is so completely right that it must be a completely artificial issue in Moscow and something that a Russian government could deal with easily if it wished to, and essentially we're just haggling over price. That is not the case. The Russian view of the historical basis of their claim on the islands is not trivial. Uh, I, I know that that is a view that is totally disputed in Tokyo, but the Russians put a, can pull out uh, a bunch of historical documents to justify their claim that are not trivial. Mm -hmm. And they take the view that this is a serious, a serious uh, territorial historical claim. Also, I would note that one should not underestimate the degree of sensitivities on the Russian side. Uh, in 1904, uh, Dartmouth College uh, hosted a big international conference on the 100th anniversary of the uh, Treaty of Portsmouth, which ended the Russo-Japanese War. I was one of the American participants. There were quite a number of participants from Tokyo, and chairs for a, a fairly distinguished group of academic participants from Moscow, all of whom canceled at the last minute. And a couple of them are people I knew, and they told me it came from the top. It came from Putin himself. But a 100 years afterwards, the Kremlin was not willing to have academics participate in a university conference on that, on that question. Interesting. This is a sensitive issue. In my view, uh, which you know, I'm certainly always willing to be proven wrong, the prospects for a, a significant settlement on the, the islands issue, for example, the two islands option, is very, very low from the Russian side. Now, I'm aware that the issue of talk, talking about the problem is in some ways as important uh, in diplomatic terms as, as reaching some kind of, of real modus vivendi on it. And I certainly think there is prospects for talking about that. But I've seen this before. Uh, Yeltsin tried to do this before. Gorbachev tried to do this before. Yeah. And if you talk about the issue, you tend to run into an impasse fairly quickly. This is not one of those issues you can talk about ad nauseum like Cyprus. Uh, this is one where the Japanese side, I think, genuinely believes that if you talk about the issue, you're somehow going to reach perhaps not a resolution of the issue right away, but at least some tangible, identifiable progress on the issue. From the Russian side, I don't think that's the case at all. You talk about the issue in order to get the state visit. You don't talk about the issue because you're really willing yeah. to make concessions. Right. So I would be very cautious about any expectation on the Japanese side that the Russian side is prepared for anything more than that uh, in the near future. Thank you very much, Wayne. So all of you uh, seem pretty skeptical about a substantive um, Russian-Japanese agreement, um, particularly on the islands. And you all make it seem like the, the 
surprise of the game here is the state visit, um, which I think I share that view. But uh, on the other hand, um, as Wayne pointed out, Russia has a kind of a deteriorating hand uh, in this game. Uh, and Abe, for personal and national reasons, um, wants to um, not necessarily have Japan go it alone, but certainly have Japan go it more than Japan has in the past. Uh, and again, from the perspective of greater Europe, a Japan that was more of a player might be desirable. So uh, what would it take to actually uh, have come, come to an agreement, uh, a substantive agreement, more than a state visit, a substantive agreement uh, between Russia and, and Japan? Let me throw that back at all of you. I'll, I'll, I'll give it a stab. Um, I think, so the Lavrov and others of late um, have been making statements that actually are pretty clear on Wayne's point that the territorial issue, that a peace treaty is separate from a territorial issue. And of course that has been kind of the refrain all the way through. Um, I don't have any inside information on what Mr. Abe's strategy is to change that or if he even believes that that's changeable. I just Does don't Lavrov know. have in the mind any uh, um, you know, does he have in mind, okay, um, what it would take to get a peace treaty? Or is, or is he just kind of saying, no, nah, that's... No, I think, I, I don't see him, I think he just wants to keep it separated. Mm -hmm. I have not seen, maybe Wayne knows more. Um, I don't see Lavrov sort of, how do we get from here to there, right. articulated clearly but, either. But meaning but that he doesn't have an idea of where the there is. Well, the peace treaty as a document, right, would yeah. be helpful to both countries, yeah, right? Yeah. But so that then means that Japan is ready to compromise on the territorial issue. Mm -hmm. And as mm -hmm. we already talked about, Japan yeah. is not. No. Um, no. And so there's feeling each other out. The interim, mm -hmm. I think some of these interim steps, though, shouldn't be discounted as being important. So I, I agree with Josh. I think the two plus two is very useful to both countries, whether it's in the military confidence building mode or it is simply uh, uh, indicating out loud and in public in the Far East that they have strategic options. Right, that there are players, right, both sides. Um, the other is, you know, the, the investment agreement is something obviously Russia needs. Uh, Japanese companies would love to have an investment agreement. They'd like the green light. Uh, Russia obviously needs it. The space agreement is another place, I think, and I'm not really sure how our administration feels about the space, the potential space cooperation. But of, of course, Japan has a sophisticated civilian space program. Mr. Abe has just reinvigorated uh, nat national spending on that. The United States and Japan together now are trying to push past civilian into a more uh, military use of that, uh, the space for the bilateral alliance. So I think there's a lot here that would help both countries, mm -hmm. short of just the symbolism of the mm -hmm. peace, peace mm -hmm. treaty. So I don't think we have to see the peace treaty right. as the only thing right. they're trying right. to achieve. The right. substantive pieces of what they pointed out in 2013, right. I think are pretty critical yeah. and would be important mm -hmm. accomplishments in and of themselves. And, and just to add before, uh, I'm curious what Wayne has to say about the Russian perspective, but my sense is that neither domestic populations have been prepared for any type of compromise. And so, you know, from a Japanese perspective, there, you know, all, all the claims and the kind of the, the, the documentation and the kind of the history and the feeling that goes behind it, it just is kind of seen as, well, Russia is such a big country. How can you possibly quibble over two little islands or mm. whatever else it is? Because right. the kind of the baseline, the obvious kind of rational choice, uh, which doesn't necessarily hold in international relations theory. We all know what the settlement in the Middle East and the Arab-Israeli conflict should be, yeah. and yet it's not. No. And I think the challenge here is we know, especially with the very small numbers of people we're talking about living on the islands, you know, this is not the same as other places, but the idea of what it represents yeah. symbolically. And so the separation of kind of a final peace uh, agreement, which I do think actually both countries have a very strong interest in, in kind of settling the World War II, uh, you know, because for all intents and purposes it is settled, but until that document is out there, it's going to be very difficult to kind of enhance other areas of cooperation. I think this is where I would point to in terms of from the Japanese perspective. Uh, I don't necessarily think that what Japan is doing on the national level and particularly from a national interest point of view is anything outside of what other countries might pursue. But the level and the perception of Mr. Abe on his own seemingly going at it from a personal diplomacy 
policy point of view and hoping that he can get this uh, is where I think expectations and capabilities sometimes fall. And from the U.S. perspective, you know, if the U.S. and Japan were working together on this, that would be a different story. And I think that ja sometimes it looks like the Japanese think they can strike a better deal with the Russians on their own. And I think that, that there's, there's deep skepticism in Washington here about that. And so I think the idea being, you know, unless you can do it in a comprehensive framework of some way, because there are so many common interests here, all the things that Sheila's pointed out. And on top of that, what does Mr. Putin get out of this, right? I mean, there are some very concrete things, but is that enough? Because from the Western perspective, you would have thought the sanctions would have changed behavior. You would have thought that the Russian economy tanking and the price of oil, all these things from a rational IR theory point of view would push you into a certain place. But Russia has time and time again historically defied those odds. So at a certain point, you have to look at history and say, is it going to change behavior? <coughs> well, I think Russia would be delighted to have substantive agreements, plural, uh, with Japan on a range of things. Mm -hmm. The question is, would those be substantive enough for Prime Minister Abe, uh, mm -hmm. given his agenda? And I think that comes back to the basic asymmetry, that the Russians want a relationship in which the territorial issue is put to the side, and for Japan, that's just not on. Uh, but I, I would say that there's another important factor from Moscow's point of view, which is maintaining an excellent relationship with Japan, getting agreements on trade, investment, space, military cooperation, getting something that might lead toward uh, a state visit, uh, or even uh, a peace treaty, though obviously that would be extremely difficult separated from the, the territorial dispute, is a means by which Russia uh, can escape from a, a American policy. I mean, American policy toward Russia is today got three components, containment, isolation, regime change. A state visit by the Russian president to Tokyo would represent a clear demonstration of the ineffectualness of American policy if the United States can't keep one of its closest allies uh, from inviting Putin for a state visit or signing agreements, uh, it demonstrates that American efforts to contain and isolate Russia are ineffectual. And I think they would be delighted. Uh, those would be uh, collateral benefits mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. any agreements yeah. that Tokyo and, and Moscow would sign. So you're saying the state visit is not such a, uh, a small price? I, yeah. I think state visits are no. very, uh, Russians are very protocol conscious. Yeah. Japanese are very protocol conscious. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, I can s still remember when Gorbachev went to Tokyo and his interpreter wasn't even wearing a dark suit. And, and just, you know, <laughs> just in the photograph, you know, he, everybody was in a dark suit mm -hmm. except for the Russian interpreter. Mm -hmm. And I just sort of thought, uh, uh. So I have one last question, which is uh, we've spoken about the personal relationship between um, Abe and Putin. I'm always skeptical about this notion of personal relationships between leaders, particularly leaders who can't actually talk to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so give me your kind of evaluation of is that relationship something that might help tip that, significantly enough that it would tip uh, a, a, a movement? I think it matters um, in this particular relationship. Most, <coughs> both Mr. Abe and Mr. Putin have um, self-images with this help, right, in lots mm. of ways. Mr. Putin looks diplomatic. Right. He looks statesmanlike. He looks sophisticated. Uh, he, he is a judo master, of course. He brings his knowledge of the Far mm. East to bear and his mm. interaction with Mr. Abe. It, 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 it matters to Mr. Abe mm. that he takes the time to do that. Yeah. They've exchanged pets. Yeah. I mean, the, there's, there, there, there's a lot to it that you can sort of say, okay, that's just <coughs> diplomacy. That's what heads of state do. But um, I don't know if this is true or not, but I had a, a, a Japanese government official say to me, you know, Mr. Putin calls Mr. Abe more than Mr. Obama does. Mm. So there's a level of commu that that mm. that there's a level of communication there, right? And comfort mm -hmm. in communication, mm -hmm. despite the mm -hmm. language, that you know, for those of you who I've never served uh, as a diplomat, so I don't know in firsthand knowledge, but I it, it matters. Does it change the basic structure that Wayne's outlining? Mm -hmm. No, I don't think so. So that's that's where I'd answer mm -hmm. that. I, I do think there's also the flip side of this is. Japan's own identity and <coughs> leadership identity. Josh was starting to get there in terms of the transfer mm -hmm. of political authority in Japan. It's been rapid. You've had new prime ministers. Mm -hmm. Mr. Abe has now been in power for some time.
I think he would like to stay in power through 2018 and if possible to 2020 mm. for the Olympics. Um, if so, he will be Japan's longest serving prime minister in the post-war period. You can't get important big things done unless you stay in office for a long time and I think that's his ambition. But on the national identity part, and this is something we can think about with the audience more broadly, is this is a moment when strong geostrategic actors, the way Josh was describing Mr. Abe, um, sell well at home. And it's not just in Japan, it's in China. Goodness gracious, we could certainly look at our presidential debate and have a little question about the United States. But, but we are in a moment of kind of global and especially regional flux where carving out new strategies, testing new relationships, presenting yourself as a geostrategic leader at home and abroad has a currency that I'm not sure mm -hmm. we, we fully would give to previous Japanese prime ministers in right. particular. It matters. Um, and I think it gives people hope that Japan has the options that Josh said that they do. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not 100% convinced the United States should, should rain on that parade sure. all that much sure. because we are headed into, or we are already in the midst of, I think a particularly important moment and we're gonna have to exercise some of this creativity ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think where the pushback is coming from Mr. Abe at home is the Japanese identity of supporting global institutions of problem solving. Japan has always been a strong multilateralist power and whether those are Bretton Woods institutions or they're the UN sponsored institutions, the G7, Japan likes and operates well and it has been very successful based on that multilateralism. So you can feel a little intellectual tug and pull here. I mm -hmm. think in the top mm -hmm. echelons of Japan's yeah. foreign policy thinkers and so we should just be aware that that's there. Okay. So I'm, I'm gonna give a, I know this is on the record so I have to be very careful in the way I do this but I, I wanna give a personal vignette about why personal diplomacy matters. I was in uh, Japan for Thanksgiving because that's where my parents live uh, and I had a chance to see the, uh, the Turkish embassy uh, and something very important happened over Thanksgiving. Unfortunately, the Turks shot down a Russian plane. Uh, and this caused a huge uh, reaction. And both sides, you know, Turkey and Russia, in some ways are not all that dissimilar from Japan and Russia, these former empires that have competed for a long period of time. Historical respect for each another, but a little bit of uh, animosity and, 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 and dis discussion there. And one of the fascinating things that came out of my conversation with somebody in the embassy uh, was the discussion of, Joshua, we don't know what's being said between President Erdogan uh, and, and Abe. They have a very close, warm relationship. Both understand English to some extent, but evidently they were exchanging text messages and conversations that were going outside of diplomatic channels. Mm -hmm. And going back to the point that I raised earlier and you just picked up on, Japan's National Security Council is relatively new. And so the National Security Council is established as part of the prime ministry now, but the people who serve there are mostly from the Gaimish or the foreign ministry along with other ministries. And so as a result, there's a little bit of friction sometimes between the bureau bureaucrats or diplomats in, the, in, in, in one area and, and the same type of thing we have in the White House where you have National Security Council members uh, and the State Department that sometimes uh, when you're serving at the White House, you take on a different persona than when you're back at Foggy Bottom. Uh, and so I think that is an illustration of, of two leaders that don't necessarily, and, and what they were discussing evidently was, was there a way that Abe could play a bridging role between Turkey and Russia? Because the one common denominator here uh, is calling uh, Abe, which is fascinating because that never would have come up in almost any other generation. And mm -hmm. the fact that we're having that conversation uh, speaks volumes in some ways. The fact that uh, what you've referenced and something I've heard as well, it, it's in some ways, this is one area that I think Mr. Putin is extremely adept yeah. at using personal mm -hmm. diplomacy. But to your point, Clyde, uh, the skeptic I think is real because it doesn't matter how far out ahead uh, these two personal leaders might go. Maybe in the case of Russia, it doesn't really matter all that much, but in the case of Japan, it matters a lot. Yeah. And because Abe, Abe san is treading on very thin ice in some ways, if, if he were to do something, for example, invite Putin to the G7 that jeopardized the yeah. U.S.-Japanese relationship, I don't think there's any amount of personal charisma, any amount of political will that would not prevent him from being taken down in some way by the establishment, whatever that means. But as we're seeing in this country, sometimes that actually the establishment can be the very cause of the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <coughs> Vladimir Putin takes very seriously his position as the senior ranking national leader on the world stage today. I mean, he's mm -hmm. the dean mm -hmm. of world leaders. Mm -hmm. He's on his third American president. He's yeah. going to have a fourth. Yeah. I don't know how many Japanese prime ministers he's dealt with, but uh, you know, more than just Shinzo Abe. When it comes to using personal relations, his attitude is when it works, fine. When it doesn't, also fine. 
uh, he is quite willing to turn on the charm, which he does have, uh, but he's not willing to do so for free. Uh, I would note that the relationship he has with a foreign leader in which they have two languages in common with Angela Merkel, where they spent many, many hours yeah. in conversation, there's really very little personal yeah. warmth there. Yeah. And that's not a recent development. There never was any personal <laughs> warmth there. Yeah. Uh, there was mutual comprehension. Yeah. But uh, the kind of relationship that uh, Putin had with Silvio Berlusconi uh, was unusual. I mean, and I um, have no doubt that Putin would be more than happy to make gestures of a kind towards Shinzo Abe to help Abe make concessions to Moscow, mm. which is to say he'll be happy to play the personal card, but not for free. Right, right. Thank you. So let's open it up to the audience here. I have one in the back, lady in the back. Victoria Butaleva, former Far Eastern resident. Can US you speak into the mic, please? Okay, Victoria Butaleva, former Far Eastern resident, U.S. consulate uh, staffer. I work for political economic issues, and I'm Russian citizen. I immigrated from Russia because of uh, security issues. Currently, yes, I listen to your just, uh, talks, uh, speeches. It's interesting, but because I worked as a political economic assistant for over 20 years, I remember Russian-Chinese agreement for when Russia passed uh, just disputable territories to China. It was a shock for the Far Eastern governors when uh, Putin passed these territories from just Khabarovsk region to China. It was a shock for everyone. And even the uh, aide to uh, governor told me, yes, probably there was a uh, just money deal, mm -hmm. but we don't know. We may know about it in the future. And now just if Putin will decide to make, make kind of peace uh, treaty or something, he may offer a hidden just supr surprise for Japan to offer them islands. But how much it will be paid, and I, d I believe that it will, it will be in a secret. Because I, I lived in Russia, I know Russia, I followed Russia, ch just ch ch Chinese, Japanese, North Korean relations. So just Putin is unpredictable. You never mm. know what, he, what he, uh, his next steps, step will be. So do not ignore. He may pass islands to Japan okay. to sign a tre treaty and to get another alliance with group. Okay, so Putin is unpredictable, well, and uh, maybe he can, maybe uh, the Japanese can buy the island. Well, first, the the border adjustment between Russia and China was just that; it was a border adjustment, and it was not the first. There had been a number of rectifications of that frontier, uh, some even during the Soviet period. Also, in recent years, the People's Republic of China has been negotiating significant border rectifications with other countries, with Kyrgyzstan, uh, ta uh, with Tajikistan. Their opening position with the Tajiks was to demand one-third of the territory of the Tajik Republic. <laughs> uh, the border rectification treaty they signed with Kyrgyzstan is what led to the fall of the Akayev government there. The rectification they did with Russia was a relatively trivial uh, matter uh, in, this, in this context. The, the islands issue with Japan is not trivial. Uh, if it were trivial, it would have been solved in the 1950s. Uh, it, and it has and not just Putin, but Medvedev have committed significant yeah. amounts of their <coughs> own prestige to this issue. Uh, in ways that were perhaps not wise, but nonetheless done. Uh, I don't see this as an issue that any amount of money uh, is, gonna, is gonna be able to deal with, particularly because, let's not forget <coughs> that in the 15 years, now going on 16 years, that Vladimir Putin has been in the Kremlin, uh, he is in some ways more vulnerable to internal forces now than he has been in the past. I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not predicting a palace coup against him any time uh, in the near future, uh, but this is a period when Vladimir Putin does not want to enable internal rivals. And yeah. do in conceding on the islands would, I think, yeah. do that. Yeah. Yeah. Next, over here. 
Thank you so much for uh, the presentation. Um, I'm a firm believer in people-to-people -people diplomacy, and we've talked a lot about the personal diplomacy and how effective it may uh, be. My question is for the young generation, the up-and-coming generation, who's interested in studying this region, what advice would you give, A, and B, um, what opportunities for young and upcoming leaders from Russia, Japan, um, do you see in the foreseeable future and maybe 50 to 100 years down the road, uh, those who will be carrying out uh, new policies? And thank you so much. And I just wanted to say, like, for personally, my daughter, she spent uh, the, let's see, what did you do? Summer study abroad in Japan last year. And so she actually attends uh, the Russian Embassy School in Washington, D.C. So she's you know, trilingual, and she's very much interested in this, um, you know, to, to continue to study this region uh, in, you know, in college. Uh, so what, my, my question to you, to the panelists, for, s for folks like this, for the young leaders and gen uh, you know, the new generation, what opportunities are there? Thank you. So let me just jump on this because I like to consider myself to be in that space in some ways, and, and I'm on the board of something called Sister Cities, which does the kind of citizen diplomacy. It's the oldest uh, group out there. You know, what we're talking about right now is very divorced in some ways. You know, when you talk about kind of the geopolitical realities of, of, you know, the calculations going on between Mr. Abe and Mr. Putin are completely divorced um, from the people-to-people the -people diplomacy that goes on because uh, particularly in a country like Russia where the, the, the civil society aspect of it is not as well developed and it's also not as impactful because it's not a democratic society in the same way. Um, we sometimes lose sight of that in Washington. It's very easy in Washington to say it has no impact, so why do it? But I think uh, having grown up in Japan uh, and having seen the value of, of these things, I think some of the personal aspects we've already mentioned, the fact that uh, Mr. Putin's really into judo, the fact that there are other areas, that's, that's fine on, on that level and may not have the impact because we're all somewhat skeptical. But there's a lot of opportunities because the only way you see change, and particularly for the next generation, you know, if you've got Japanese that are now growing up who don't know anything about war, right? I mean, the, the generation of kind of my grandparents' generation, the greatest generation as we talk about in this country, the same generation in Japan, when I would grow up, I would have Japanese, you know, what I would call my grandfathers, uh, who would basically come up and thank me every, like, you know, every war day, every August 15th or whatever else. And I would sit there as a child being just horrified. It's like, you're thanking me for having my grandfather who flew bombers and bombed uh, and, and actually carried weapons all over and bombed thousands of people in Japan. It was very uncomfortable. But I think that reality of understanding that that generation of Japanese has a very different feeling. And so when you talk about nationalism and you talk about the current generation that kind of feels a sense of why aren't we a normal country? Yeah, well, Japan should be a more <coughs> militaristic and national society. They're not thinking in the same way that their grandparents did who saw the horrors of war. And so if you can ingrain that in some way through an educational system that allows you to talk freely and openly about the suffering, not just of the Russian people and thinking about the number of people who were killed, not just because of war, but also because of the policy choices that were made, which is very difficult to have that conversation in the country. I mean, my dissertation looked at the role of historical memories. And when I studied the school textbooks in Japan, even for as great as the Japanese system is, there are periods of time that are not as well treated as others, right? And so the resurgence right now and the, the, the focus on focusing on pre-1930s Japan is great if you remember what happened in the 1930s, if you remember and you honor that past. And so you can't simply whitewash the problems that your neighbors have with you because of what happened in Nanking, what happened uh, in Korea and other areas. So it's not whitewashing. It's, that's the role of civil society to play. And so when you think about these relationships, whether it's between the educational systems or whether it's because of the sister cities relationships between Vladivostok and Sapporo, for example, or Portland, which are all sister cities in different ways, the thing I would love to be able to see, and I, and I think here the U.S. too often you sit in any country around the world people are very anti-american anti-american government but they're very pro-american they want to send their kids here to go to school they want to drink coca-cola they like mcdonald's they like hollywood all these other things finding a way to square that circle is really important and that's where those of us that have had the privilege to represent our country and worked in the state department feel strongly and believe in kind of the educational and cultural activities that we do the most successful program that the state department runs which is not very well known is actually our ivlp program which is our international visitor leader exchange program where we've had more heads of state more people 
people that have gone on, not because they were heads of state now, but because back then the U.S. embassies on the ground engaged with them. So I have a, I have a, a kind of a feeling toward letting the local embassies, letting the local staffs engage, not because they have a strategic vision in the next couple of years, but because that's the right thing to do and that's the type of country we are, so we need to invest in that. So I, I'll take a stand off my soapbox right now. <laughs> Can I just I, say I, what? I, oh, go ahead. I, go would, ahead. I would just note that from my perspective, a skill set that contains both the Russian and yeah. Japanese yeah. languages strikes me as golden. <laughs> I mean, I can tell you that even during the Cold War, I mean, I, the number of people in the Foreign Service, in the Pentagon, the, the intelligence community in the United States who had both of those languages, I can sort of remember, <laughs> you know, <laughs> about this many fingers. Yeah. Uh, it's a very, very rare combination mm -hmm. of skills. Uh, and, I mean, uh, you may not be interested in a career in government, but I can tell you that uh, at a time when the United States, when the, shall we say, the bench is pretty thin on the Russia side uh, in the U.S. government, uh, that anybody who is able not just to speak those languages, but to understand what people mean when they speak those languages. Because mm. language skills are not about speaking. Mm. They're about mm. listening and understanding. And that tho to have those two languages, that strikes me as a uh, very salutable uh, skill set. I was just gonna, I was just going to say, if you if you haven't tried to apply to the State Department, I'm sure there'll be lots of people who would like to see that kind of application <laughs> for exactly those reasons. But if you know, it, it, what's interesting to me is again, we're at, we are talking about strategic relationships in the Far East. But you know, I was stunned. Uh, I, I I went to Ko to do the research for my book on Japan China, and they have a great East Asia department. Um, they have great scholars there. So if you want to go and further that kind of research, there's a lot of Japanese universities where I could think that they would be very happy to have you. But what also stunned me is for those of you who know Tokyo, Keio is very close to a fairly fashionable district with lots of foreigners. And I was walking up, my son used to like what particular spaghetti restaurants, okay, he's younger than you. Um, and I went to those restaurants when we went back and everybody was speaking Russian. It was very, it's Azabu and Kidol and places like that, which is a very high-end foreigner expat community. There were a lot of Russians in Tokyo. And I found that really kind of fascinating mm. because, mm. We, again, we talk about the political disconnect, but on the economic side of things, uh, there are much more, there's a lot more going on uh, in, in the Tokyo, in the, in the Russia. Japan relationship. Yeah, now these might be the Moscow expats, the global, the global Russians, if you can call them that. Um, but there's an awful lot of economic backing and forthing. So whether you want to go mm -hmm. into government or you want the private sector experience, uh, there, there's obvious places where you can your talents will be well put to use. Anybody else down here? Yeah. <coughs> uh, Peter Humphrey, I'm an intel analyst and former diplomat. Mm -hmm. There's banishingly few examples of. of strategic withdrawals without military force. Hong Kong comes to mind, uh, Israel out of, out of, Syri out of Lebanon, uh, Syria out of Lebanon, and Israel out of Sinai, the only ones I can think of. So in, in the Japanese mind, is the fantasy that Russian troops will actually pack up their bags and go home from these islands, is that an actual vision? Uh, to me, that seems beyond absurd, and I wonder if there <laughs> might be another pathway where these islands are divided up perhaps by uh, Russia maintaining uh, territorial control over the rock and the fishing rights and methane energy resources are given to Japan, some sort of split the difference kind of thing, which would also work, by the way, in Dokto, Takashima. Um, since I'm not a believer in the vision, <laughs> I'm, it's a hard to defend <laughs> it. So I, I, I wouldn't go so far, though, as to call it a fantasy, to be honest. Um, I think there is a real belief, as Wayne said, that Japan is right, right? And that there's also a strong belief that the Russian-Japanese relationship has not been exploited to its full potential. And by that, we mean all of the kinds of agreements that Mr. Abe and Mr. Putin are currently discussing today. That there's ample latitude if there's a prescription, whether it's Mr. Putin's surprise or whether it's a different kind of concoction about how to manage their differences, um, that that will open a whole lot of opportunity for both sides. So I think they, there is an appreciation of this moment, um, if not 
you know, completely realism, realistic assessment of just how willing Russia is to do this. There have been plans floated. So if you go back to the Gorbachev conversation and then the Yeltsin conversation, um, there were joint administration uh, ideas. There were, it was not always the two-state solution of split the difference. We get our two, you get your two. There was joint administration, joint fisheries, joint exploitation of resources, joint, 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 in which the sovereignty issue was um, somehow adeptly dealt with and the economic exploitation and investment opportunities were expanded. So there have been in the past those kinds of, of conversations. What I don't think the signals are, and Medvedev comes to mind largely because he went there with his Polaroid camera about why this is our Far Eastern tourist destination, but he also, and Putin then followed suit by inviting uh, Korean investors who invest in the Northern Islands. And you know, for the Japanese, it's just unpalatable, right? So whether that was a direct poke uh, in the face of Mr. Abe, was it a tit-for-tat response to something that Mr. Abe was doing? I, 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 I don't know. Um, but it is kind of, for me, I, I think getting back to that joint administration idea with multiple investors that weren't just Japanese and Russians would be very difficult for Tokyo, I suspect, right? So. As a former diplomat, I would also say that negotiating a joint administration like that yes. is a negotiation that will go on for yeah. generations, yes. <laughs> which may be the point. Yeah. 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 Did you have a question? Yes. Yeah, I would <coughs> – Dan Russell, U.S. Uh, Russia Business Council. I can only agree with Wayne on the, the asymmetry of this and, and having dealt with the Japanese over the past few decades. I've never really understood how they expect to get something for nothing uh, because the Russians are very American in their hardball approach to negotiations. And I, uh, I think the panelists have all hit good notes. I, I think there's a slight overstatement of the idea of a state visit in G7 and how much these things matter to Russia at this point. I think that's an old playbook. Uh, Russia was very pro-globalization, very pro trying to get into different clubs up until 2012-ish. Mm. And if you look at their foreign policy and the international isolation and the sanctions that uh, Mr. Putin has been willing to deal with now, I think you have to question whether that sort of strategy is going to deliver the results you want. Yeah. Well, this is certainly not my expertise, but we haven't actually talked about G7 sanctions mm. in the G7 conversation mm. itself. And so <coughs> I will tentatively go on some very thin ice just to raise the question you know, we're assuming the sanctions stay in place as they are. We're assuming that there is no uh, end in sight. We're assuming that the U.S., Europe, Japan uh, thinking on this continues to be consistent, right? I, I just don't know enough, and maybe other people in the room do, but there is go a conversation to be had very shortly about what happens to the sanctions regime uh, and whether an, an analysis of whether it's been effective and an analysis, and perhaps a rethinking on Mr. Putin's part, I don't know, Wayne, if you want to help us with that, about what the G7 sanctions actually meant for Russia, but, or, or you, who might be able to help us with that. But, but the G7 piece is really what has put Mr. Abe's diplomacy, personal and national, in a slight bind. Um, but I, I don't see the Japan walking away from that. The question is whether the G7 restructures the mm -hmm. way it's thinking vis-a-vis uh, -vis Putin, and I just don't his know. response. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, well, you know, the other, I mean, I work on sanctions every day. Uh, okay. G7 sanctions is a turn I've never heard. Mm -hmm. uh, it just doesn't come up. Mm -hmm. Most people look at it, really, you're looking at the sanctions that really apply to the, uh, are the European sanctions. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you have the United States and Canada, a very similar regime. <coughs> Japan sanctions are not appreciated uh, in Washington because they're not Spanish. Mm -hmm. uh, they, don't, yeah. they don't rise to that level. When the Russians look at, at sanctions or at driving a wedge, it's between the United States and Europe because it's European sanctions uh, they, they want to lift. I mean, we could talk all afternoon about sanctions. Yeah. I, I don't think it is necessarily a given that sanctions in their current state will stay in place uh, this way <coughs> for another year. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of that depends on what Russia chooses to do uh, with, its, uh, with its Ukraine policy. Yeah. And there are many ways to slice this. We probably don't have sanctions on Crimea forever, right. mm -hmm. but they right. really matter because the trade in space right. is about what you do about the Ukraine. Ukraine. Yeah. But, but in some ways, the reality of those sanctions and the, the what you're doing in terms of deals, in terms of companies having to navigate this, 
in some ways is less important than the perceptions of them, right? And so I, I would start where Wayne started in some ways to say the Japanese didn't have a dog in this fight and yet they went along symbolically. And so the idea that they even have to keep this symbolism up when they have such other dire issues in, the, in, in Far East Asia where they say, look, you know, we've got North Korea that's on kind of on this very bizarre kind of throwing missiles off every once in a while and kind of, you know, nobody's really doing anything about it. The six party talks are for all intents and purposes not existent and a very fraught uh, Chinese-Japanese relationship, which actually in some ways, to be fair, has gotten a lot warmer over the last year, uh, not because of personal diplomacy, but because of the fact that they both are looking at each other and realizing they have to deal with each other. Now, you know, Shield made a face, and I, I would agree, <laughs> it's not warm by any standards of Japanese relations, but warm by the awkward shake hands that began two years ago, and, and the fact that Abe, in some ways, if you're going to find any Japanese leader that's going to have to make uh, to work with China. It's not about making a deal, it's about working with China in some ways, not together, but simply to accept that they exist. And so whether it's like the AIB situation or whether it's other areas, Japan is saying, okay, like we need more support here. And so if America is going, and the Europeans are gonna focus all their energies on the Ukraine piece of the equation and Crimea, what about South China Sea? What about us? What about these other areas that matter? And I think that's where, um, you know, I think at the State Department level and Department of Defense and maybe even the White House national security level uh, and the fact that, as Sheila said, the White House has come out and President Obama has gone on the record as defending the Senkakus as being Japanese, et cetera, et cetera, should give enough, uh, you know, should, should reassure our ally enough, but for some reason it isn't. And so this flirtation uh, between Japan and Russia is particularly uh, distressing. You know, when you look at the type of diplomacy going on between U.S. and Japan, we're used to dealing a lot of energy and time on the really hard issues like Okinawa and what to do about our bases. We're not used to spending as much time on these issues because we should be on the same page. And so the fact that uh, there is a Japanese prime minister that in a very Japanese way and maybe not so Japanese way is pushing back very strongly on these areas is what matters. And the reason we're talking about this is because of the fact there's not been a door closed on the G7. It would be very easy for Mr. Prime Minister Abe to come out and to kibosh all this, but you have conversations coming out of his National Security Council, and you have disagreements even within the foreign ministry in different areas here. And so, you know, the messaging here matters, and so that's where I would simply take issue on, on what you were saying, and I don't disagree with the larger point here. I would simply say that you're right, uh, but the, the, the perceptions matter more than the reality of that. Uh, I, Dan, I will certainly agree with you about Russia turning away from globalization. But that doesn't mean they've turned away from liking global manifestations of Russian derozhavnost, you know, global recognitions of Russia's great power status. <coughs> and state visits are great photo ops. And a state visit to Tokyo would be, in many ways, a great achievement. I mean, I can actually, I could write the editorials <laughs> in <laughs> Russian journals, basically, that would say, take that, Obama. Take that, Merkel. You know, we have alternatives. You think uh, you think you can isolate and contain us? I mean, I you know I, I think that anybody who has been on a red carpet as long and as often as Vladimir Putin does, <laughs> not only gets some gratification from it in an e in ego terms, but also understands the uses of it in both foreign and domestic politics. Yeah. And as long as he could get that state yeah. visit at yeah. a reasonable price, which is a huge yeah. hit clause, yeah. uh, I, th I, I think he would welcome it. Hmm. Interesting. Over here. Thank you. Um, so I've been paying attention to a lot uh, with Russian policy <laughs> and really the strategic, um, I guess the strategic mindset of, of Vladimir Putin um, and generally, he's depicted as this chess player who's making all these moves five, five moves ahead, and he's very strategic. Um, and so I'm wondering what the strategy, uh, what do you guys think his strategy is behind this? Keeping in mind um, the truth, troop withdrawal from Syria as well, does that signal more of a shift um, because of, I guess, the opportunity costs of devoting these resources to these foreign endeavors, and they want to focus more on domestic policies? So they're withdrawing troops from Syria, and they want to um, kind of settle the Japan uh, island dispute. Or does it more signal a shift towards more antagonism towards the West for NATO, Ukraine, sanctions, things like that? Um, yeah. Okay, well, I, I personally don't think that the Russia-Japan relationship has anything to do with Syria or uh, Ukraine directly indirectly on Ukraine because Japan is part of the overall symbolic sanctions. 
I think it's much more uh, a reflection of the fact that Russia doesn't want in the Far East to be that much dependent mm -hmm. on China. I mean, it, it also, r r Moscow works very hard to develop its relations with the Republic of Korea, uh, with countries like uh, Singapore, with, uh, with Malaysia. Uh, I think <laughs> Russia thinks of itself as being an Asia-Pacific country, and as I said, but it's having a hard time maintaining itself as an Asia-Pacific power. Uh, and I think that the relationship with Japan is one where they think that the potential for improvement on a range of issues that is unfulfilled is substantial. And that they, what they th hope is that that can be fleshed out and <coughs> expanded without making the kinds of concessions that would be, of course, terribly important in Tokyo. Uh, actually, I've never heard that Putin was much of a chess player. Uh, I mean, I've heard a lot of things about him and about him growing up, uh, but as a, as a chess player, I don't think, I, I mean, I can't recall any reference to that, whatever. He uses Watson. So, so if I can just make one comment on that, I think it's important, even in the metaphors we use, right? So chess is a very kind of Western conception of this, invented in Iran of all places, right? And it's fascinating because when you grow up in Asia, you think about other ways of playing the game. Go, where you surround your opponent and you flip them in some ways. Or even Japanese shogi, which is Japanese chess, the pieces always come back to life. It's never finished. And so you can kill a pawn, you can kill something else. It will never come back. And so I think the metaphors there are interesting. I was recently in Europe, as I said, one of the funny things was someone was making this exact same analogy, and someone said, well, maybe Russia's playing uh, at chess in some ways, the, the Chinese are playing Go, and is America playing Russian roulette with its policy? And I, you know, I'll leave that just as, as it is. <laughs> Did you, you have a question here? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> My name is Varvara. I'm a local filmmaker. Um, Can you speak a little louder, a little please? Closer, sure. Yeah. Is this better? Yeah. Yeah, okay. that's better. Um, I just had a question about Japan. Does it consider the rest of the G7 um, weak for the way that they conduct diplomacy in regards to Russia? Um, hmm. And to be more detailed, like if they do, is it just a demonstrative critique from Japan of the rest of the G7's worldview that like even the misalignment between them and you know, talking past each other, as Mr. Mary said, um, is more of a result of America and Europe's resistance to employ a more whole contextual or, you know, personal flavor to their diplomatic efforts. I can take a first yeah. stab at that yeah. one. Um, no, I don't think that Japan looks at either the European or the United States members of G7 as being weak. Uh, I just think Japanese interests are different. So the European response to Crimea and the Ukraine for obvious reasons was much more, it was much more immediate, right? A resurgent Russia, a territorially expansionist Russia, uh, the, the dis dissolution of, or whatever other word you might use to, to talk about Ukraine, right? But it, it's a serious strategic interest of Germany, of NATO, of the rest of Europe, right? Um, Japan is distant from all that. Doesn't mean it doesn't matter. And when I was talking to Japanese diplomats and friends and others, of course, you know, if Russia can do that in Europe, then what can China do in the Far East? So there is this question of the general norms of international behavior. Uh, was the referendum acceptable? No, the Japanese obviously didn't accept the Crimean referendum either, right? Um, so so the Japan, again, to go back to my earlier point about international norms and rules, right? Um, very much saw that as not acceptable behavior. But it's not on its border. It's not next door to it. It's not Taiwan, right? Or it's not Korea, right? The Korean Peninsula. So it's distant in that sense. But the behavior is problematic for the Japanese, obviously. Um, Japan also, I mean, everything, I, I don't, I don't want to paint a Japan, Japanese foreign policy elite that see everything through the lens of China. But of course, they do sit in Asia, and they do look at the resurgence of Chinese influence, and they look at the territorial disputes around them. Um, they look at the rise in military power, right? And so they see an unsettling picture for their future. And so the alliance with the United States matters a lot. Um, U.S. pressure <laughs> on the G7 issue mattered a lot. So that also has to be factored in. But I don't know that Japan, I think most Japanese business and government leaders would completely understand um, Merkel's, Chancellor Merkel's exquisite dilemma, right, in trying to work mm. through this problem, right? 
given the energy dependencies, Japan's dependency is high, right? Given the historic relationship between Germany and Russia, I mean, all kinds of reasons. Uh, so I think there's a great deal of interest and respect for the way she has tried to uh, be as assertive as she can of German interests, right? And take a principled stance at the same time. So I, I, again, I don't see any evidence that there is weakness or, you know, by individual leaders in the G7. Uh, I just think that the, that the parallels then translate over into an Asian mm -hmm. strategic mm -hmm. context that then uh, is not always that clear for Japan, right? So it's, it's caught between a rock and a hard place. It's caught between being a member of the G7 and wanting to support and sustain international norms and rules, but also having its own bilateral strategic interests in improving the relationship with Moscow. Mm -hmm. Let me just put a small twist on this. I agree with Sheila and what she said. The one thing I would say is Japan's proactive diplomacy in the last couple of years and Abe-san's very kind of interesting approach. You know, clo having closer relations with the U.S. is nothing new. What is interesting is his approach to Europe, and we've seen a conscious deci decision by Prime Minister Abe to visit NATO, to, to enhance Japan-NATO cooperation, to work in terms of understanding Germany as the most important player in, in, in Europe, and the real frustration in Japan about Britain, because Britain used to be the closest European ally to the Japanese. It's an island nation off of a continent. They have a lot of co commonality. <laughs> but Britain's extreme flirtation with China has really irritated Japan and said, you know what, Japan, uh, it, Britain's going down this path. We can't seem to stop this marriage going on between Osborne and, and, and the Chinese leadership. We've got to find other, other routes. And so I think that actually it's not about weakness in leadership, but the weakness in general of the international order. And so I think in that case, the G7 might be more important to the Japanese than to Americans. And uh, the Japanese realize that all the gains they've made over the last 70 years that were put in place because of this international system of the UN <coughs> and everything else is under a threat by Russian action and by the Chinese. The problem is the emphasis being placed on it. And I think sometimes they wish there was a stronger unifying leader in the West. It doesn't matter if it's Angela Merkel or President Obama that could bring everyone together. But because of this lack of unity and the lack of the G7 as being the, the place to be like it was during the Cold War, uh, there's no place anymore like that. The G20 doesn't seem to have its role in the same place after the financial crisis. Is it the G7? And, and obviously, since they're hosting it, they want it to be one of the most important players right now. It'll be interesting to see how they feel about American leadership a year from now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I would just make two points. Well, first, we haven't talked a lot about China. But if you're Russia, if you're Japan, if you're talking about Russia, I mean, China is always this looming presence that whose gravitational field affects everything that's going on. Yeah. Second, uh, at the risk of stereotyping Russians, uh, which I don't like to do because I've lived here so long, Russians do think about East Asian nations in very different terms. They have, tend to have very positive and warm relations with Koreans. That's partly because there's a big ethnic Korean population in Russia, and always has been. Their relations with Chinese are conflicted. I mean, don't forget that the real territorial dispute is not between Japan and Russia. It's between Russia and China. I mean, you know, you go to the People's Liberation Army Museum in, mm. in Beijing, you see a map of what they consider to be China. It includes Habarovsky Krai and Primorsky Krai, and the Russians know that. Uh, with Japan, the Russians understand that there's no threat to Russia from Japan. But they also have a, I think Russians, in my experience, have difficulty trying to put themselves in the Japanese perspective. I think they're much better at understanding how the Chinese see things, how the Koreans mm -hmm. see things, how the Indians <coughs> see things. In my experience, when it comes to dealing with the Japanese, the Russians tend to be uneasy, baffled, and often come to the wrong conclusions. Okay, we're at the witching hour here. Um, we can take maybe uh, one more question. So down here, you've been asking for a while. You heard about this? Thank you. I'm Peter Toshi Azuma from Africa Worldwide. So my question is re, you know, related to Prime Minister Abe's scheduled visit to Sochi early May. How do you think this unofficial visit to Sochi, an unofficial summit with Putin, will impact Western um, uh, sanction strategy? I suspect sanction, w European and American sanction strategy will be unaffected by yeah. it. I would agree, but I, I, you know, again, let's set up the little hurdles that we've got ahead. Abe san will be here. Prime Minister Abe will be here at the end of March for the nuclear summit, right? So he'll be here in town. 
uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov goes uh, to Japan in April, mm -hmm. right, to pave the way, right, um, for Abe's visit to, to, to Russia. And then, of course, at the end of May, you've got the, the G7 meeting itself, hosted by Japan. Um, I suspect, I, I'm going to be watching very interest, uh, I'm very interested to see. Uh, I think there is some sincere belief that maybe there's still possibility of trying to figure out uh, some negotiation that would have <coughs> Mr. Putin come to the G7. I don't think that's likely to, to come to fruition. I don't think it's going to change the strategy on sanctions specifically at all. I think Mr. Abe is hoping to find a little window where as the host of G7, he can perhaps facilitate uh, in some way, uh, if not rapprochement, at least some kind of concrete diplomatic conversation. Mm -hmm. Don't think it's going to be received well here, but I don't think it's directly linked to sanctions itself. Good. I don't know. There was a man in the very rear. Did you have a question? The gentleman there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we can hear you. <laughs> uh, yeah, Ken Mark or World Docs. What is the situation with regard to Japanese imports of Russian oil and gas, and what are the future prospects? Well, there are the existing long-term contracts <coughs> of supplies from Sakhalin, uh, and they're being fulfilled. Uh, my understanding is that there's not much prospect, however, of an increase uh, of Japanese uh, imports or dependencies uh, on uh, Russian oil and gas. In part, I mean, they're looking at Australia uh, and, and, and Indonesia. Uh, but the, the, you know, the, the Sakhalin uh, contracts, as far as uh, I'm aware, are just ticking along. The, the, the place of Russian exports to Japan changed, of course, after 2011 when the LNG exports increased, right? When Japan went offline, the nuclear went offline. I think the other factor that seems to have an import is we don't often talk about crude supplies. Russia is now number four in terms of suppliers to Japan of crude. And that comes out of the, um, what's it called, the Eastern Siberia Pacific Ocean Pipeline that opened in 2010, I think. So Russia is a major source for the Japanese, but it's not the only. The only thing I would say is that the China factor here is really important. That big Russia-China energy deal that was struck right. that no one knew the terms of really scares the Japanese and in some ways it is kind of the overarching cloud through which they're thinking about it. And, uh, you know, I think that maybe in this town it doesn't matter as much about the price of oil and the fluctuations, but in Japan it has an extreme impact on the economy. And so finding some way to diversify their dependency uh, on certain areas, Russia has always been kind of one of those strategic areas. Very good. Well, thank you very much. It's been a stimulating discussion, I think a useful one. So let me thank the audience. Let me thank our panel.